Hello everybody, I'm finally back with another video from my series Quick Falls On, in which I share with you my opinions about the next Star Trek story. Today I'm going to talk a bit about the penultimate episode from Star Trek the Animated Series called How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. The story begins on the Enterprise, tracing the origins of a mysterious alien space probe. It came to our solar system, scanned everything and signaled something to space. Before any Federation vessels managed to intercept it, the probe self-destructed. And the Enterprise soon encounters a strange alien vessel, which suddenly creates a huge force field around the Enterprise. The Enterprise tries to blast herself out of it, uh, when suddenly something strange happens with the alien ship. I don't really know what it is, to be honest. In reality, the image of the ship is overlaid with a semi-transparent image of a huge serpent. What does this mean story-wise? Did the ship transform to a huge serpent? Or was the ship uh, the serpent itself? The serpent was recognized by Ensign Dawson Walking Bear to be Kukulkan, an ancient uh, Mayan god. When he screams his name, the ship slash serpent stops firing and transports uh, different members of the Enterprise crew, namely Dr. McCoy, Scotty, Walking Bear and Kirk himself. Walking Bear is a Comanche and he is a historian, that's why he immediately recognizes the attacker as Kukulkan, or if you want Quetzalcoatl, the serpent deity who visited uh, American Indians in the Middle Ages, gave them instructions to build their cities and left, promising to come back. However, he never came back, uh, instead of him the Europeans arrived and the rest is history. The four kidnapped Enterprise crew members find themselves in a strange room, which transforms into a hot desert, later also to a green forest, and then suddenly to a strange town. In the middle of the town there is a strange huge pyramid, and it's surrounded by four serpent heads on huge pillars. Kirk, being the genius he is, finds out that the serpent heads need to be turned uh, on the middle of the pyramid. When they do it, the thing on the top of the pyramid starts to shine and suddenly the serpent himself appears, the real Kukulkan, or Kuklakan if you prefer Shatner's pronunciation. He asks them to kill him because they obviously want to do that. When Kirk explains to him that uh, they were uh, shooting at him only in self-defense, because Kukulkan shot first, just like Han Solo, and Kukulkan has the best defense speech ever. He shot at them because he could. I have to try that one day, I'm curious if it work. Then he transports them to a very special type of zoo, because we have never seen a story before in which our heroes uh, would be treated as zoo animals, right? And Kukulkan has there some very interesting animals. A uh, free-eyed green freak, purple camel, fish head, a dementor and a cucumber in a blonde wig. And of course, a capellan power cat. Because we haven't seen enough cat monsters on track yet, right? At least we are told that the animals are mentally in their natural habitats. And that is what Kukulkan planned to do with the Indians if they build the cities correctly. So is that supposed to be a treat because it sounds like a punishment to me? But what do I know? I'm not a god. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, Spock manages to find a way how to blast themselves from the force field bubble in which the Enterprise is captured by Kukulkan himself, so they can start searching for Kukulkan's ship. Kukulkan, for some reason, attacks his hostages, at least I think that's what's going on, but he gets distracted by the fact uh, he doesn't have the Enterprise under control anymore. The hostages have a quote-unquote brilliant idea, 
they decide to free the power cat and it starts to cause mayhem. The Enterprise starts to fire at KKK's ship and the poor snake doesn't know what to do. Kirk even mocks him, at least I think that's what is going on, and asks him why he doesn't save them from the dangerous cat. You know, the cat, they freed themselves a few seconds ago. So Kirk has to solve the problem. The problem he caused. McCoy gives him the tranquilizer, Kirk drugs the cat and uh, the wild beast turns into a cute little kitty. See kids? Does somebody you know behave in a way you don't like? Drug them. That's the moral of the story, right? Kirk has his typical Kirk speech, which saves the day. This time it's about uh, how the daddy snake has to let his kids, called humans, live their own lives and that mankind doesn't need any gods anymore. That's by the way typical Gene Roddenberry. He has created in many stories uh, godlike creatures only to let our heroes uh, tell them to F off. I'm not really that religious myself, uh, but I think it happens a bit too often for me. The episode ends on the bridge with a typical and, well, wonderful banter between Spock, Kirk and McCoy. When McCoy asks Spock if Vulcans don't have any myths about other aliens visiting their planet, Spock replies that they don't have any myths, but they have the truth. Vulcan was visited by aliens from another planet, and they left much wiser. I love it. And of course, we get the explanation of the title. It's a quote from a certain Mr. called William Shatner or Shakespeare or something like that. It comes from King Lear and the full version is How sharper than a serpent's tooth is to have a thankless child. The end. When I was a kid, I used to go to the public library very often. Oh, one day I found there a book from a guy I actually heard about before a Swiss writer called Erich von Däniken. I read the book and was absolutely fascinated by it, and by the end of the year I have read every book he published until that time. In the case you don't know his work, to be extremely brief, he came with a theory which basically says that all of the ancient gods of all civilizations, and that of course includes the Christian god, Jehovah and all of the angels and similar beings were actually ancient astronauts from other planets. A slightly longer version, there was a war in space, one of the alien races came down to earth to mine for some minerals they needed, but because the work was too hard they took a primitive monkey-like creature and uh, using genetical engineering they turned the monkey into a human and they repeated the same process many times. The humans were basically their slaves. Then they rebelled and the aliens or gods had to flee from Earth, but they regularly returned back to Earth, influencing new and new civilizations and of course promising to return back. And last but not least, these gods or their offsprings are still to this day regularly coming back to Earth to observe us in their spaceships we now call flying saucers or UFOs. Now, I don't think he's correct. In many cases he was absolutely wrong and in many cases he contradicts himself. But I as a child was fascinated by just the idea that uh, all of the gods I read about in mythological books or in the Bible were actually visitors from outer space. Again, I don't take it very seriously, but I admit thanks to this theory we have a lot of great science fiction stories. The most famous one is of course Stargate, which is a huge sci-fi franchise which would not exist without uh, von Däniken's books. And of course also some Star Trek episodes. Who Mourns for Donis from uh, TOS comes to my mind. And of course How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth from the animated series. Later shows also played with this thought, but uh, I might talk about them sometimes in the future. 
This episode was written by two fascinating people. Russell Bates, maybe the first Native American, or whatever is the politically correct term, who became a sci-fi writer and uh, obsessional actor, and David Wise, writer for all of the animated shows I always loved, like the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which he also managed to successfully adapt from the comic book to the TV show, or the original Transformers, or of course the animated masterpiece called Batman the Animated Series. I love most of these guys' work, so you won't be surprised when I say that I really like this episode. But still, there are some things I just have to point out. The first one is Kukul Khan's ship. Is the giant serpent supposed to be Kukul Khan himself? That's what I was thinking when I've seen the show for the very first time, sometimes in the 90s. Or does he travel in a spaceship which looks like himself? Isn't that a bit too much? I mean, humans don't fly around in spaceships uh, in the shape of a giant human, right? I also don't like how Kukul Khan is portrayed in this episode. He's being portrayed here uh, as the enemy, but at the same time we should feel sympathy for him. I mean, if you could uh, compare him with Apollo from the original series, he was a very sympathetic figure and after the episode is over I am genuinely sorry that he had to be destroyed. I don't feel anything for Kukul Khan. I like the fact that the Indian Ensign is just a guy, he doesn't have any mystical superpowers like Chakoti from Voyager, he's just a guy who is, by the way, a Comanche. A part of me feels like that if he was written today, he would be written by a white person and he would be made into some political figure instead of simply a competent officer. I also love the pacing of this episode. It feels like it's five minutes long, it doesn't waste your time with any stupid padding like many other episodes. It's a very pleasant surprise. I thought a lot about the rating of this one, I really love it, but it's far from perfect. I would give it a 9 out of 10. This is the only episode which got an Emmy, and I fully see why. But as always, those were just my opinions, feel free to leave your opinions down in the comment section. And if you liked my random rambling about this episode, hit that thumbs up button. You can also watch any of the previous episodes uh, in which I covered all of the episodes from the first season of uh, the original series and all of the previous episodes from the animated series. If you watch uh, my videos regularly, you have probably noticed some changes. The fact is that uh, thanks to the so-called apocalypse, I had to return back to my day job which means I don't have that much time for this channel anymore, especially I don't make any money from it. So I can't guarantee any dates anymore, but next week, or to be more precise, sometimes next week, I will do two quick thoughts on videos. The first one will be about the final episode of the animated series called The Counterclock Incident, and the second video will be about the episode Amok time. Yes, next Friday will be the 50th anniversary of the opening uh, of season 2 of the original series. So I hope I will be able to finish that video till Friday. But anyway, thank you very much for watching and see you next week. Thanks, bye.